Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. According to the New York City Economic Development Corporation, as of February 2012, there were 1.1 million pets living in New York City, of which 500,000 were cats and 600,000 were dogs. In a city where people live in relatively small spaces, dogs seem to have it over cats when it comes to people's preferred pets. Even though keeping a dog requires daily walking and all kinds of weather, and some would say almost as much tending to as a small child. Why are dogs so beloved by New Yorkers? And what are their lives like here? And what role do they play in the life of the city? Ken Foster, director of the Community Pets Program in the Bronx for the Animal Care Centers of New York City, visited scores of dogs and their owners in all five boroughs and answers those questions in his book, City of Dogs, published by Penguin Random House. Along with photographer Treyer Scott, he reveals the multifaceted relationships New Yorkers have with their dogs in moving stories and candid images. Welcome. Thank you. You've been writing about dogs for a long time. What sparked your interest in writing about dogs and uh, what inspired you to write City of Dogs in particular? Well, I always wanted to be a writer from when I was just a little kid and I would dictate stories to my mother before I could spell. Um, and I eventually decided I wanted to be a fiction writer, wrote a collection of short stories that was published um, and then got a dog. Um, and I didn't get a dog thinking that that was gonna change everything about my life, uh, but it did in, in a very positive way. Um, and I would run into an editor that I'd worked with before with her dog in the park in the morning uh, this is back when I lived in the East Village, and she kept saying, like, oh, you should write about dogs. You should do a book about dogs. And at the time, I was such a new dog owner, even though I'd grown up with pets. This was my first pet that was truly mine. Um, I thought, like, I don't, I don't know anything. How could I possibly write a book about it? Uh, but ultimately, I did write a book called The Dogs Who Found Me that was about my sort of journey of falling in love with dogs and then beginning to rescue stray dogs. Um, and once I did that, I, I sort of never looked back, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to really connect with a lot of people who, and, and partially because I, I wrote from the point of view of somebody who doesn't quite know what he's doing, um, which is the experience that we all have when we adopt our first dog or even just a new dog, because all dogs are individuals and we discover that they have their own quirks and expectations and rules that we have to abide by. <laughs> Um, so that was my first dog book. And then um, more recently, I left the city, moved to New Orleans for over 10 years. Um, and then three and a half years ago, came back to live outside of New York, but to work specifically in the Bronx with ACC doing a new program called Community Pets, um, where we go into neighborhoods that don't have access to a lot of resources for their pets um, and provide those resources through free vaccination clinics, free dog training, pet food pantry, things like that, in order, on the one hand, to just be a, a resource, but also to hopefully keep some of those pets from ending up in the city shelter. Because so many people really love their pets, but they struggle with, you know, with the issues that so many people do in, in neighborhoods where the economics aren't what people think of necessarily when they think of New York City. Right. But but it's the way things are. Um, now you have observed, you've lived in several different cities and you have observed people's relationships with their dogs in all of those cities. Um, is a relationship between New Yorkers and their dogs different? Or how would you describe it? I think it is different in a way. And one of the things that was so wonderful about coming back to New York is that I introduced, I was introduced through dogs to all these neighborhoods that I didn't know, first in the Bronx, and then when we decided to do this book and explore the whole city in, in all the boroughs. And so it was a shorthand, like once you bond over somebody's dog, they, they welcome you, I think, into their neighborhood, into their lives, and they share things that they might not otherwise share with people. Um, but I think New Yorkers and their dogs, because it is such a, uh, bustling city and space is limited sometimes people think that means it's not as good for a dog but it means that as dog owners we have to 
find ways out. Um, we go out with our dogs more. We go for long walks with our dogs. We go to the park and play with other dogs and meet other people through them. Um, and so I think, you know, city, New York City dog owners, um, they're, they're much more hands-on with their dogs because they have to be. They sort of have to manage their schedule and their dog's schedule um, because the dog's going to be home in an apartment but also needs to get out throughout the day. And you found that it, being in New York is not, is not such a bad life for a dog, right? No. One of, one of the other things that sort of contributed to my deciding to do the book was that I would hear from people, especially on social media, that just would go on and on about how awful they imagined life must be for these poor dogs living in apartments in New York City. And of course, I found the opposite to be true because, you know, the city is full of people who love their dogs, whose dogs reconnect them to the world in a, in a different way. Because I think, again, because it's New York and because it can be overwhelming, sometimes we cut ourselves off a little bit from the world. But, uh, also but dogs when, bring us back out again. And, and dogs also, are so social. When I walk around the city and I see people leading these dogs, well, sometimes they're carrying the dog, sometimes they're pushing the dogs in strollers. I wish somebody would push me around the city. Uh, you see the dogs in their fancy coats and sweaters and the shoes. Of course, I don't know if the, if the dogs like the clothes as, as much as their owners do. But um, they get, dogs get pampered a lot in New York City. They do. And even the dogs that aren't necessarily, you know, from wealthy families or whatever you might call it. Um, you know, at some of our events in the Bronx, in the wintertime, every dog is wearing clothes. Some of them were wear, are wear more layers than I do in the wintertime. Um, and, and it's because everybody knows the dollar store that has the, the deal on dog clothes. They also, you know, custom make clothes using like their old winter coat becomes their dog's winter coat. Um, <laughs> do, dogs like, of, do dogs like wearing clothes? My dogs have never liked wearing clothes. My dogs are nudists, I guess. Um, but I do see dogs that seem, seem to certainly not mind wearing clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it becomes an expression of how people feel, uh, you know, about their pet and about themselves. So how long did the research for this book take and how many dogs and their owners were involved? Well, I, because I sort of was inspired by some of the work I was doing with the community programs at ACC, we, we interact with thousands of dogs and their owners over the course of a year. Um, and then because we wanted to expand it beyond that, um, we were scouting and going around the city and introducing ourselves to people on the street, um, getting recommendations from friends of friends. So I'm guessing maybe about 4,000 were in the mix at some wow. point in the process, um, which surprised me when I sat down and was sort of thinking it through to figure out like how many dogs have I met in the past <clears throat> year and a half or so. Um, it's a lot of dogs. Um, and they're almost all happy to be here in the city. <laughs> Tell me about some of your most memorable dog families. There's so many of them. And I think the thing that surprised both me and Treyer, the photographer, was how uh, connected we felt with people after just spending you know, maybe two or three hours with them um, where, you know, we felt really an emotional bond and we cared about them. Um, but we tried to also make sure that we had a real variety of dogs and people. So um, we have a young teenager um, in Queens who is autistic and has a dog that is trained to be by her side to help her with her autism and also to have something to hold on to um, because she was getting too old to hold her mother's hand. Um, and, and so that she now has a dog to hold on to. Um, so it's sort of like an anchor for her, which I found really fascinating. And it also made me realize dogs really are kind of an anchor for all of us in one way or another, sometimes literally and sometimes just emotionally. Um, so that was one of the unusual ones. We also went into um, a building in Chelsea where Barry Diller's company is, and they're allowed to bring dogs to work there. So we did a whole series of photographs of people with their dog in their It was office. like, it's a, a one day a week thing that dogs can come? I think it's a one, it's one day a week, I think, or okay. one day a month, but we, we got a bunch all so in the like same bring day. Your dog, bring your dog to work day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and they talked about how calming it is to have a dog at work because you can take a little break and then you get back to being really productive. Um, so 
um, that was an interesting aspect to look at. We went to JFK and spent time with the Homeland Security dogs who all love their job because it's like a game that they're playing all day long. Trying to sniff out drugs or oh, whatever. And agriculture stuff, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but, but it's, the, you know, I kept thinking if we should all love our jobs as much as these dogs love their job. Um, Why also, do firefighters, is, you know, the, the, the firehouse dog, uh, does virtually every firehouse have a dog and where'd that start? It started, I believe, with having dogs to safeguard the horses as they ran to the fire. Um, and then, of course, obviously, at a certain point, we stopped using horse-drawn carriages, but the dogs sort of remained. And also, I think, because the men are there in shifts all the time, and they're not always, hopefully, being called to a fire, it's a companionship as well. Um, the, the fire dog that we have, who's on the cover of the book as well, is um, Riggs, who's from the fire factory in Harlem. And he, unlike, you know, most people think of Dalmatians for a fire dog, he's an English bulldog. So he's just a big round, like bowling ball of a dog. Um, and when we were there taking pictures of him, he got called away, the, the men got called away, I should say. And so he was left behind and we have this amazing picture of him just laying in front of their hanging uniforms, sort of all by himself. Very sorry for himself, um, but adorable. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also, you know, we have families in the book. There's a family in Staten Island that has um, triplets and an older daughter and two dogs that they ended up getting almost by accident. Um, that was a great family portrait. Yeah, and they, I mean, it's a great family. It's a great family portrait. And like many of the families in the book, the Michellos uh, were people that I kind of walked away from trying to plot ways that I could be adopted, you know? By the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also Staten Island, which I'd never been to before, which is kind of embarrassing to admit, but it's such a beautiful place with amazing parks and lots of space. Um, and I so thought, you, you know, the dogs here probably don't even know that they live in New York City. Yeah, so you got to a lot of different places that you had not been, would not have gone if you hadn't been doing this book. And it seems that a lot of the dog owners by, through, by walking their dogs, go to a, discover a lot of places that they didn't, weren't familiar with as a result of having a dog. Yeah, it's true. And I know that was my experience as a dog owner in the city as well. Um, one of the stories in the book and one of the people in the book is Majora Carter from Hunts Point in the Bronx. And um, she talks about, she found a stray dog, adopted it, and it dragged her one day into this abandoned um, sort of dumping ground and she thought, like, why is this a dump? Like, why is it okay to have this, what was a green space, filled with garbage just because it's in this neighborhood? Um, and so she began a campaign to change that and to turn that space back into something that could be used for the community. And it really was all because of her dog. Yeah, she um, became a, a well-known environmentalist. I know, right, and, and right. it's the dog that started it. Right, you know? <laughs> okay. We're gonna take a short break, then we'll be back with Ken Foster, author of City of Dogs. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking to Ken Foster, the co-author, along with photographer Treyer Scott, of City of Dogs. You said, or you write in your book, that dogs differ from borough to borough. <laughs> Tell me about some of the differences. Um, well, I mean, I always feel like I have to put a disclaimer before I answer this kind of question because I do think dogs are individuals and I also think people are individuals. And so I try not to group them, but now I'm gonna group them. Um, but I think one of the things that I fell in love with in the Bronx through dogs and their families is that everybody seems to be part of an extended family and that includes the dogs. So if you meet a dog and you talk to their owner, you end up hearing stories about all of the dog's relatives their dogs, dog cousins. Um, <laughs> and so everybody's connected in that sort of way, whether it's a true family or a sort of family of choice. Um, and that is incredibly fun um, because, because you meet one person, you meet 20 people um, and their dogs. Um, in uh, Staten Island, like I was talking about earlier a little bit, uh, because there's so much space and it's so much quieter there, I feel like they're um, calmer and have a much more relaxed lifestyle. Um, 
Manhattan because it is so bustling and busy and there's so many things going on at the same time in any given block. I feel like um, you know Manhattan dogs are a little bit cosmopolitan, which maybe is a polite way of saying a little bit aloof, you know, because they've seen everything, you know. <laughs> um, and then in Queens, I found maybe the most diversity, both in the types of dogs there as well as the communities themselves. Um, in particular, there was a group of people at a dog park in Long Island City that we visited. And um, it's amazing because everybody, every dog, every person is a completely, um, you know, completely unique in that fi picture and in that story. Um, you know, there's a little chihuahua, there's a corgi, there's a big sort of sheepdog, there's a pit bull, they're all best friends and their owners all meet every morning without fail. Um, which again is another example of how dogs bring us all together. Um, and then Brooklyn, I felt like, and this could be partially just the, the particular dogs we met, but a lot of them were single dogs, whereas a lot of people surprisingly have multiple dogs in the other boroughs. Um, but so the Brooklyn dogs that were the only dog in their household, I felt like maybe felt a little bit like the center of the world. Um, mm. And I have joked that maybe Brooklyn feels that way too. Because um, <laughs> it's amazing to me, you know, having been in and out of New York over decades, what Brooklyn has become. Yeah. It makes, it makes uh, Manhattan seem very humble in comparison. <laughs> you do. I mean, a major thing, as you pointed out, a major theme in your book is that do the way dogs connect human beings all over the city, bring them together with people that perhaps they would not have relationships or have met or known otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I mean, one of my favorite sort of romantic stories in the book is um, Asher and Ariella, who have two children now, but they tell the story of their first date, which he... <laughs> Um, he brought his dog with him and picked her up and I don't know where they went, but when he went to drop her off at the end of the date, the dog had been staying in the back seat of the car and leaned forward and gave her a good night kiss. And she says that's when she knew the date had gone well. Probably before that she's saying, why is this guy bringing this dog? <laughs> but it was the kiss, it was the dog kiss that did it. Yeah, she had his approval, <laughs> I guess. Um, and now they have two kids and a dog in, in you know, a relatively small apartment. Um, and the dog just loves those two kids so much, um, which is also incredibly moving to see. Um, yeah. You write that re the real estate, real estate in New York City has an impact on dog ownership and how dogs live in the city. T tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, as gentrification has occurred in every neighborhood, people are constantly having to reassess where they live um, they're being pushed out of where they live. They're having to find new <coughs> options of where they can live. And, and sometimes that limits the ability to have a pet. Um, and the tragedy is oftentimes people might have a pet already and they end up having to find new housing and they can't find housing that will let them keep that pet, which is why some end up in the city shelters. Um, but also there are people who know, like, they know it's important that they keep their dog, so they're going to stay in whatever situation they're that in. That allows them to keep the yeah. dog. Or they've moved somewhere, and in moving, they discovered a dog park near their apartment. And for the first time now, they're going to consider getting a dog. Um, Any idea how many dog parks there are in the city? Uh, I wish I knew. Is the number growing? Yeah, the number's growing, and I know, particularly in the Bronx, there are some new ones coming up. Um, but the, the first dog park was the dog park in the East Village. That was the very first which one? Just a, just a few decades ago. Um, and it's called First Run for that reason. Ah. But what they found and what other cities have found is that having a dog park not only gives a place for community and exercise of people and their dogs, but it also creates traffic, sometimes in neighborhoods or areas that didn't have a lot of pedestrian traffic. And that is a good thing, both for businesses, it also reduces crime. A lot of people that are criminally inclined, don't want to be around dogs. Around dogs, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so they, they've been popping up more and more and more. Um, and sometimes they start as unofficial little corners of a park where the dog owners Go unofficially gather, to. and then um, eventually they get sanctioned to, to do it more appropriately with a fence. I didn't know before reading your book that dogs can go off leash in Central Park at night. Yes. 
And I, I was aware of that. And I was aware of also some time ago, there was a big debate about whether it should or shouldn't be allowed. But I'd never experienced it until we went into Central Park at night with um, Lydia, who is a dog trainer, and her two dogs sort of taking us on a tour of the Central Park dog world. At so night. you've got probably hundreds of joggers running at night and you've got all of these dogs around. That must be a whole scene. We didn't see that many joggers. It was mostly people with dogs, which okay. was, was so fascinating because it's, you know, it's dark, but there are these scattered lamps and the moon was out. And so there was the moonlight and you could see the outlines of trees and outlines of little step bridges. And it seemed like a fairy tale almost. Were the dogs being at the moon? Uh, none that I was with, <laughs> um, but you would see like, you know, little groups of people with their dogs suddenly come around a corner or um, over a little bridge. Um, and then everybody, you know, like the dogs would run and greet each other. Uh, and the people knew each other, even in the dark. You know, when you have a dog at your side, you can do a little bit more exploring down an unknown street than yeah. you might if you're totally alone. Tell me about your work with the community pet program in the Bronx. Well, the idea is, and it's an idea that I think is getting more popular around the country. Um, you know, it used to be that animal welfare or animal shelters were about being just sort of a last stop to keep dogs from roaming and getting in people's way on the street. Um, but increasingly, obviously, it's moved towards finding homes for those animals, and now it's moving... Because, because also the pet shelters also used to be a place where dogs go in, but most of them didn't come out. Right, exactly. They were euthanized. I mean, so it's when, you know, when people called it the dog pound, where it was like almost like a, the jail equivalent, you know? Right. Um, but now what ACC is doing and other places around the country is trying to be more of a resource to pet owners so that animals don't end up being stray. Um, so if people have questions or if they're having issues, even sometimes housing issues that could be resolved with some assistance, um, we want to be able to help them with that. So, um, so the particular aspects of that that I'm involved in are doing free vaccination clinics, which we do about once a month in different neighborhoods in the Bronx. We have a pet food pantry, so if somebody loses their job and it, or is between jobs, they can come and get food and not worry about that expense being an issue. Um, and then we also do free dog training because a lot of times people, uh, you know, they don't know a dog trainer. They don't know anyone that has used a dog trainer, but they might have some behavior issues that to them are overwhelming. But there may be a simple solution when you know the right tools. Around the city, a lot of people who are set up on different corners, maybe on the weekend, you know, adopt a dog and they'll have a few dogs. You know, there seems to be more dog activism going on in the city. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, um, when I adopted my dog back in 2000, my first dog, I got him from a shelter in Brooklyn and I just sort of randomly found them online. I didn't even know there was a city shelter. Um, and, and now there are so many rescue groups, which is great because everyone's sort of doing what they can and doing things in whatever style they're comfortable with. And it helps reach a greater number of people, both in helping with people's pets as well as with finding appropriate homes for those pets as well. Tell me about your own dogs. <laughs> um, well, my first dog, Brando, who I think of still every day, even though he passed away a few years ago, was a dog that, um, he, was a blue, uh, he was a brown brindle dog, which is the striped pattern that looks sort of like a tiger. Um, and it's one of the reasons I picked him um, was that I'd never really seen a dog like that before. And he was about 30 pounds, and I was told that he was fully grown. And he ended up being 100 pounds. And I lived in this tiny, like 120 square foot um, single room apartment in the East Village that the two of us were, you know, by each other's side in. Uh, and he had horrible separation anxiety, which um, I think he taught me how to also have separation anxiety. So we were very bonded to each other. Um, but he also, you know, he loved people. He loved the people that he loved particularly. Um, he was very observant, and so he made me more observant in the world um, about people, about nature, about everything. You know, we would be in the park and a plane would go overhead and he would watch it pass over the sky. I remember somebody said to me, dogs don't normally do that, <laughs> which I don't know if that's true or not, but he did. He wanted to see everything. 
Um, he wanted to travel. <laughs> yes, exactly. And he did. He traveled uh, all over the Southeast country. But um, because of him, I also started noticing stray dogs, which then led to my writing more about dogs mm -hmm. as well as working with all these And now you have how many? I have a number of dogs in a house outside the city, um, a lot of pit bulls um, and a Rottweiler. Um, and, and they're all older now. Some of them, uh, most of them came from New Orleans with me when I moved okay. back from New Orleans three years ago. Um, and they'd been part of an organization I was with there and had been adopted into homes and for various reasons years later needed a place to go. Okay. So I thought I was taking them temporarily, but they're okay. still with me. What you want your readers to take away from your book? Well, I hope that people see the role that dogs play in so many different ways in our lives in the city, whether you have a dog or not, they're there and they're part of our communities. And also I really hope people seeing all these different neighborhoods realize that um, you know we all get sort of boxed into our familiar zones and there's so many great places to explore in the city for us and for our dogs. Well, I loved your, I loved your book. And, and Thank you. <laughs> the stories are great and the pictures are great. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Ken Foster for joining me today. His book, City of Dogs, co-authored by photographer Treyer Scott, is published by Penguin Random House and is available online and in bookstores. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.